Terry Sparks, you're the first one on here. Felice, happy, happy. Hey, Bobby, that's you, not your name. What's up, Rebecca? Rebecca, Becky. John, good to see you. What's going on, Felice? Good to see you. Just got back from a wedding. I had to do a wedding that went a little longer than what we thought. Nick, what's up, buddy? Hello, Becky. I miss you already. You gotta hurry up and come back and visit. Hello, Cass. Felice, Felice. Donna Pena, what are you doing, girl? Dina, good evening, sir. Ready for the word. Okay, me too. Sharon, good to see you. Hi, Jason. I've been waiting all day for truck church. Oh, good deal. I've been waiting all day trying to get here so we could do it. <laughs> Kenneth, what's up? Chris Hood, what's up, buddy? Happy Sunday, brother. Yeah, happy Sunday to you too. Penny, good to see you on here. Everybody's rolling in quick. Just getting home from harvest. Okay, hopefully that went well. Jenny, hello. James Grover, how you doing, my brother? God bless you for your service. Thank you, James. I appreciate that, buddy. Savannah, good to see you. Kenneth, hello, buddy. Man, it seems like nighttime might be better. Everybody's rolling in. Debbie, hello, hello. Chris, I appreciate you and your wife. Thank you for that blessing the other day. Clint Hilton. Yeah, nighttime might be better. Tommy, what's up, buddy? Appreciate you keeping me updated. Wayne, where's Miss Sharon at? Jackie Mills, good to see you, friend. Becky Warden, Warden. Uh, North Carolina, is that right, Becky? Drew Smith, what's up, buddy? Looking forward to the word, me too. Olivia, you're supposed to be taking a nap. She's recovering from a surgery. Blessings to you and your family, Jason. Thank you, Becky. Michael Romine, what's up, buddy? finally catch a live truck. Drew, I haven't seen you in a while, but uh, I guess it was because the uh, having to go back to church and changing the time and all that. It's 9.32 in Kentucky. Okay. We got Kentucky, North Carolina. Drew, you're up there in the north too. Where you at, buddy? Hey there, Jason. Give us what? I'm guessing that was supposed to be the word. <laughs> oh, man. How's everybody doing? I guess y'all can hear me just fine. God has for us. Okay, there you go. Give us what God has for us. Good. Because I had about two and a half minutes to get ready for this. So <laughs> we're all going to see what God has for us. Just a busy day. Had church this morning and uh, went home and ate dinner with the family and did a little bit of chilling. Then I had to leave and uh, come get ready for a last minute wedding. We kind of threw together like real quick at the last minute. Rhonda, good to see you. And then went up there, there, Sharon. Then went to the wedding, did the wedding real quick ate real fast and then I didn't have time to make it all the way back to Grand Saline where I normally do it at the lake but I found another lake I've got to be by the water so I just came to the Canton one of the city lakes in Canton to do this so found us a lake let's see Carolyn Phillips good to see you she's from way up north too Lynn Hester I was thinking about you yesterday good to see you Lynn hope everybody's doing well if it gets dark I'll turn on some lights here in a minute See how the truck's gonna do. It's been acting funny again today. Uh -huh. Clint, good to see you, buddy. Virginia Lang, yeah, nighttime seems to be good. Like more people are freed up to do the live. Rita, Janice, Janice, uh, I answered you in Messenger before I went live, so hopefully you read that. If it didn't make sense, let me know. I can cover that real quick. Might be something that other people want to know. Ready to hear the mighty word. Amen. Michael Martin, good to see you, buddy. David Lucas, what's up, man? Savannah, hello, hello. Prayers for Torres, 10 wings in lockdown for COVID. Oh, no, do they have some positive cases in there? They got to. That's got to be why they locked it down. Matt, God bless you for what you did for my brother. Amen, man. That was a, that was a blessing, man. Your brother Nick got saved and baptized in the Grand Saline Lake. He's been on fire ever since. He's a week old today. A week old. About broke our ankles getting in the lake too. We fell in the hole twice. I did. Susan Lamont, Lee Eagle. What time is it? 8.35. Okay, I'm going to give it like uh, one minute, maybe two minutes, and we'll pray in and we'll get started. Ray Shake Elliott, all the way up in Washington. Good to see you on here, buddy. Man, I got some stuff I'm gonna say. I almost miss, uh, wish me and you were doing this uh, truck church together today, Ray, just to get your feedback, but I guess I'll just read your comments and stuff. And Got something that I learned this morning that I didn't know. 
something I'm gonna bring up and just get your pick your brain on while we're doing truck church. Everybody can give their opinion, but explain the scripture you gave. Okay, I will, Janice. As soon as I pray, I'll cover what Janice asked me, and then um, we'll do that. Uh, Ron Hood, truck church. Erica Esquivel. Hey, girl, how are you? What's going on, Ray? Not much, man. Another busy day. Uh, ready for truck church. Melissa, good evening. Good evening. Good to see you. Didn't have a whole bunch of time to get ready, but I'm not worried about that. I'm trying to do the same. Man, Matt, let me know whenever you're ready, man. We can do it in the same place if you want to. You can drive down. We'll go to the lake, do some talking. We'll pray, and we'll, uh, we'll get you in that water too, buddy. Whenever you're ready, let me know. Well, there's a couple weeks I won't be able to do it, but we'll, uh, we'll work it out. All right, we'll go one more minute here and we'll pray. Did you get filled up on my piece of cake? <laughs> the cupcakes, yes, sir. I ate one. Tammy Allen, hello. Give it one more minute, uh, minute and then we'll, we'll pray and we'll get this thing going. Jessica Nemo, man, good to see you on here. We went to high school together. I like those pictures that you post. Curtis Odom, what's up, buddy? One of my preacher friends. Caitlin Pruitt is here. Everybody's rolling in. We might need to start doing truck church late at night. Seems like people are uh, more available. We might just do that. Yeah, we are going to be learning together at the same time tonight. Hello, Tammy. Good to see you. Hope you and Brett are well. Just didn't have a whole bunch of time to get ready. Uh, but that's okay. God is faithful with his word. So we'll just learn together at the same time. Then I'm going to need some feedback. Diana Hood. Raji just licked your face. So that means he licked your phone. <laughs> awesome. Uh, James Blaylock. Hey, man. What's up? Okay. It's 837. I don't want to wait too long because uh, people lose interest whenever you spend 10 minutes waiting everybody to get on here so we got a little over 40 people here so let's get started let's pray uh, let me go ahead and get some lights going on in there boom see if that helps okay all right let's pray dear jesus lord i love you so much you are so awesome and i thank you for um, this weekend i thank you for the last couple of weeks have just been amazing uh, filled with god moments two men getting saved last sunday and baptized in the grand saline lake cousin getting baptized like the week before and then all the baptism baptisms that I saw at church and all the baptisms uh, they had at Driven Life a week ago just you've been on the move in the midst of all this chaos and that just blesses me and motivates me um, to just keep doing what we're doing and we just thank you that no matter what's going on no matter the chaos no matter how hopeless it looks no matter how many people are asking where is God I just thank you I'm thankful that you are here you're involved and uh, you're sitting back just being patient, letting more and more people come to you, Father God. They might be screaming for you, they might be crying out for you to come, but most people that are crying out for you to come aren't actually ready for you to come. And that's not something they want to find out on that day when you do come. So thank you for Terry and thank you for taking your time. Thank you for giving us grace um, for those who have not come to salvation so that they can be able to. I thank you for your word today. I thank you that uh, even though I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, that's okay, Lord God, this is your word. You know how to teach it better than anybody, so I just pray as always that you take over my train of thought, that you would um, take over my tongue so that I would say and think the things that you're wanting me to say and think. Um, my friend Olivia, lift up, her up to you right now. She just had to go to the ER um, last night and then again today and then have emergency surgery, so thank you that she came out of that well. I know she's sore and tired. Just bless her, heal her, let her recover soon anybody else that's on here right now we're going to watch the replay later that are going through things father god i just pray that you would meet them right where they are where they are father god uh, thank you for this next few minutes whatever we take thank you for your word make it alive let it take root in our heart and we just pray that satan will not be able to come along immediately and steal that word from our hearts father god so we just give this time to you just have your way take control father god teach us your word teach us your ways father god and um, i just thank you for fresh revelation as we go through this lord in jesus name i pray amen Amen. So who did I miss? Real quick. Uh, so, da, 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 uh, Natalia is here. Sonia Gregg. Good to see you. Ron is on here too. All right. Hope you guys are ready. I'm guessing you can hear me okay. Because nobody said that you couldn't. So we're going to take off here. Um, let's see here. Did anything happen this week that I wanted to bring up? Um, last Sunday, two men uh, from Truck Church came down to the Grand Saline Lake. We got to uh, lead them in prayer to salvation and then right there just go out into the lake and, um, and baptize them right there on the spot. And it was just beautiful and it was awesome. 
at the same time we were doing that, Driven Life had several people that they were uh, bap baptizing, and the week prior to that, um, there was probably 25 or 30 people at a church in Winsboro um, that were getting saved and baptized. Just, um, just amazing, because I'm always like, man, God, how come it doesn't seem like you move like you did when I was a kid? But God corrected me on that because he's still moving. The problem is, is us as people, we're not responding to God like we did back when we were younger or whatever. So it's not God. He hasn't changed anything. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But people respond differently than they used to. And uh, people run from the altar and things like that. But uh, it's just been a blessing the last two weeks just to watch God move. All these baptisms, I've probably got to witness, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 baptisms. Uh, lots of people getting saved. Randy, good to see you, buddy. Custer Mind Faith, good to see you. Mom, good to see you. Um, so God's on the move. He's always been on the move. And the only reason it seems like he slowed down is because his people slow down. His people quit responding is what it is for whatever excuses that we had. And then probably my greatest blessing this last week was I got invited to go speak at New Frontier Cowboy Church. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your powerful presence. Amen. Sam Eman, hey, man, I'm talking about it right now. Just want to hit on this real quick. Um, I wish I could have went every day, but I got invited to go to New to the Cowboy Church in Canton new frontier cowboy church and they had a youth camp meeting there and uh it was going to be a bigger deal it wasn't that big of a deal because the virus I'm, I'm sorry it wasn't as big as what it was supposed to be people wise because of the virus a lot of churches and stuff backed out um but none of that matters the people that were involved in that ministry have been in ministry long enough to know that the numbers doesn't count it doesn't matter if you've got um 400 kids there if you've got 12 or whatever but we end up having 12 kids there and i got invited to speak and share um thursday night and I'm, I won't rehash everything because there was just too many beautiful moments there. But uh, the one thing that I love differently about preaching at a church or preaching at some kind of big event or revival or even truck church um, is whenever you're doing it with, whenever you're there with youth and ministering to youth, God just doesn't let me do the normal thing that we do. Um, we just kind of get right before them, right in front of them in their face, not in a horrible way, but just on their level and just talk to them and invite them in. And um, the theme that they have was to move, whether that means just to move, whether that means to move closer to God, move towards God, whatever. But uh, even during the worship, man, the very first song, there was one youth, I think he's 14 years old, boom, he runs and gets on his face at the altar. Then another guy does. Then later on, a, um, a young girl that was just crushed and going through a lot of stuff two people grab her and take her to the altar and they just cry and they pray and then um there was a lady a girl that was up there helping with the um the worship you know and god just hits her right there in the middle of worship and this young girl that i think she's 13 or 14 years old comes down the stairs turns around and gets on her face before god at the altar nobody asking them nobody ushering them to do it nobody guiding them they just do it on their own accord and it just blessed me and it moved me to tears because you've heard me say on here before um, I don't know what the deal is with us as adults while we run from the altar and while we'll peel the polish and the padding off of the pews or the chairs to keep from moving during the altar call. But these kids, nobody had to tell them to do it. They just did it on their own. So then uh, we get started. They sit them down. And then um, there was a young girl there that just cried probably through the last two or three songs, just pouring her heart. You could tell she was broken, absolutely broken. And um, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't get it off my mind. So I um, talked to the 12 kids, told them there's some business going on already. And whenever God presents business, we stop and we take care of business. We don't have to stick to any kind of protocol or routine or whatever. And so uh, I went around the room and I talked to those 12 kids and asked them how important it was for them to go to war over their friends and their family and things like that and be leaders and not allowing people to despise their age and things like that. And basically got a commitment out of all of them that they were going to do whatever they could whenever they could, whenever God called. And I said, okay, good, right now is a good time. So the girl that was um, crying and breaking down for several songs and another girl that had got on her face, I called them to the middle and then got the other 10 to just surround them. And uh, out of the 12, I think probably eight of them, I asked them who was willing to pray and go to war over them. And man, these kids laid hands on them and took turns praying and just, hey, Naomi, uh, went to praying their guts out over these two young girls. And, and I can't tell you, I'm going to tell you, but I could feel it more than I could put it into words. I, I knew it was a big moment for those two girls. I just didn't, but really my mind was ministry wise. Like we're training these kids how to not wait till they're adults to do ministry, how to do it right now. And we train these kids, these friends, they're all friends of each other, how to go to war for each other. So we didn't call up the elders. We didn't call up the, the 
you know, the pastors and preachers and stuff, we asked the kids that were comfortable praying to go to war for these two girls, and they did, man. They went to war with this girl. All the prayers were beautiful, and then there's this one young girl there um, named Brooklyn, and man, when that girl prayed, I had to open up my eyes because I thought I was listening to like this seasoned vet. She prayed like my great-grandmother used to pray after being saved for 60 or 70 years, and I just was blown away by the depth of this girl's prayers, which obviously told us that she's called to uh, intercede, intercessory prayer. Anyway, it's all said and done. And then I just, I, I preached a sermon, I talked some stuff, but I kept them involved the whole time asking them questions. And one of the questions I was asking them is what's one thing that keeps you from moving closer to God? Because I love teaching and I love preaching, but I love learning too. And there's no better way than learning than learning on the, on the spot in the heat of the moment. And so I was asking these kids, what is it that keeps you from, I asked them, the first question I asked them was, how close do you feel to God? And probably half of them said they felt really close to God already. And some of them said that uh, they didn't feel so close, but they were feeling called back to him already. The second question was, hey, Sherry, good to see you, sweetie. The second question was, what is it that keeps you from moving closer to God? And man, these were the answers that I just wanted to hear. And one girl was 11 years old. And she already knows that she's called to uh, d do ministry and music and stuff. And this 11-year-old girl told me that her deal was several people's kids said they didn't know. They weren't real sure. But they did know they wanted to get closer to God. But this 11-year-old girl, uh, Sarai is her name. And she ended up blessing me so much later on. But um, she said confidence. Confidence is what keeps her from getting closer to God. Not being confident in who she is. Not being confident in her gifts and talents. She knows she loves to sing. But just at 11 years old, she really struggles with confidence. At 11 years old, this girl knew that her struggle with getting as close to God as she could was confidence. And so, boom, we get to minister to her right there on confidence. And and uh, mine was distraction, the just distractions in life. And a couple other kids said that theirs were distractions too. The girl that had been crying uh, for a long, long, long time, hers was trauma. She said, I've been through so much trauma in my life. And she's still crying while she's, while she's saying it. But she goes, man, I, up to this moment, you know, I've had so much trauma in my life, but she said, I can just feel God calling me tonight. And I'm just like on the inside, I'm wanting to cry, I'm wanting to laugh, I'm wanting to rejoice, I'm wanting to just explode because I knew that, that we just had had a God moment. I didn't know how big it was. I didn't know the depth of it or whatever. Hey, Cricket, good to see you. I, I didn't know, I, I knew it was big, but I didn't know how big. And now I'm getting to hear it out of her mouth saying, I've been through so much trauma. You know, just days ago, I was ready to end it all. And it wasn't just days ago. There's been a long time in my life that I've just been ready to end it all. But two days ago was the last time I was ready to end it all. I've got scars all up and down my arms for cutting and stuff. And she goes, something changed tonight. I can feel God calling me back. And she said, so up to this point, trauma is what has kept me from getting close to God. And she said, on the flip side of that before tonight, when I read the stories in the Bible and I watch other Christians, I still watch them go through trauma. So she's like, if I'm going through trauma before Christ, and then I'm going to sign up for this Jesus stuff and go through trauma after, like, what's really the difference? And man, God just hit me. And I was like, you know what? Before Trump, before Christ, Satan is throwing out all this trauma to try to destroy you and distract you and keep you from Christ. What's different is, is after you get saved and you go through trauma, the difference is the trauma is not even about you anymore. The difference is, is you go through trauma. So the world watches you go through trauma with your God. And then they ask you, how did you make it? How did you go through this with a smile on your face? How did you go through this without giving up hope? How did you go through this without ending it all and killing yourself? How, the trauma after you get saved is all about the people around you watching. The trauma is no longer about you. So really we don't even have the right or the necessity to uh, take offense at our trauma or ask God, where are you? Because your trauma after Christ is not even about you. You're the one going through it. But trauma after Christ is not about you. Trauma after Christ is to get the attention of the lost of those around you so they can watch you go through it. And then as long as you're allowing Jesus to be the reason why you're coming through it, they're going to end up asking, like, how did you make it through this? And your trauma now becomes your platform to witness to those that are lost. And, man, she just got it. And we kept going around the room, and it was beautiful. But when when um, the service was over with, we had just enough adults. God had shown me this picture of whenever we're done, instead of doing, like, an altar call, have those 12 kids stand up and have the adults come forward and one adult in front of one kid and then have the worship team go up there and just worship their guts out. And then every uh, each adult that has a kid, just pour your guts out into these kids in prayer. Just 
pray your guts out. It don't matter if it's five minutes, if we're sitting here 30 minutes to an hour, but pray, pray, pray. And we did that. Each adult took a kid and we just laid hands and we prayed our, our guts out on these kids. And there was lots of tears in the room and stuff. And you know, I met a, um, I met a 12 year old boy. I mean, I think us adults forget, not that we didn't go through stuff. We all have our stories, but I think we forget that our kids are growing up in a much more cruel world than what we did. And uh, I met this 12 year old boy. And when I heard his story, I didn't even have words for a few seconds there. This 12 year old boy struggles getting close to people. He struggles uh, having close friendships. And um, before I could ask him why, he started in on his story. And two years ago, him and his best friend were on a four wheeler and he was the one driving and they flipped that thing and his friend uh, landed wrong or the four wheeler landed on top of him, whatever it was that happened. But um, it was it was fatal. And while they were 10 years old, hey, Laura, good to see you on here. Mandy, good to see you too. So you got a 12-year-old boy telling me the story the other night at a youth camp meeting. 12 years old, two years ago, him and his best friend are on a four-wheeler. He's driving. They flip the four-wheeler, and it becomes fatal. And he sat there and had to watch his best friend die. And obviously, he's taken on all the guilt and shame because, one, it was his best friend, and, two, he was the one driving. At 10 years old, at 10 years old, he's watching his best friend take his last breaths. And he and two years ago, he watched his best friend die right there on the scene of that wreck. And this 12-year-old, now two years later, this 12-year-old is relaying this story to me. And it is just absolutely killing me on the inside to hear this story. And because of that now, he struggles with friendships. One, he thinks that taking on new best friends is replacing his old best friend. And two... He just struggles getting close to people because the last person that he was extremely close to not only died, but he had to watch them die and take their last breaths. So, of course, my brain is going, if he's struggling this hard getting close to people and friends, I can imagine how Satan is going to uh, use that as an opportunity to keep him from getting close to Christ, right? So just, man, just gut-wrenching stories there that night, and everybody there was like between the ages of 11 and 17. So when we're all done, the girl that was crying for a long time that night, she goes, can I talk to you? And these are my favorite moments. Not, I love preaching, I love teaching, I love seeing God change lives and stuff, but my favorite moments is when all that stuff is over with and people come and grab you and ask to sit down to talk to you because that's when it's really gonna come out. And so we went and sat down and we talked for probably 30 or 45 minutes. Uh, uh, being in the presence of young kids experiencing God is one of the most amazing and humbling things to see they are so open and unashamed of their worship. It blesses me every time. Gives us hope for the future. We need that boldness and freedom in the spirit. Amen. Absolutely. So this girl, uh, I think she's 14. She just cried her guts out. So we sit down and she shared the story. And I won't, I won't share it all on here. But she's when she said that she's been through trauma, this girl has been through some relentless, unending trauma for any person of any age. But she's only 14. And she's wanted to end it several times. And she said, uh, that's right, you should have seen Sarai this morning. Ah, I wish I could have, man. You'll have to tell me about it. That's my girl, and I'll tell you why here in a second, but you already know. So uh, Sam's talking about the 11-year-old right now, who's so he's talking about. But um, So the 14-year-old sits me down, and she tells me her story, and, and I hear the trauma. And she tells me how many times she had almost ended it, and the scars on her arms that prove it, and the pills that she had taken uh, to end it. And, of course, God spared her. But, but let me tell you just a couple, two things that I took away from that conversation. One was the big moment where she said, but tonight everything changes. Tonight I feel God calling me back. Tonight I feel like God allowed all the trauma to bring me to this place tonight to where I would just let him all the way in and I would give him everything. A 14-year-old, man, I know 50 and 60 and 70-year-olds that have not come to this conclusion or the second conclusion she gave me. She said, so before this night, all the trauma has destroyed her to the point to where she has felt like she wanted to end it all. And on one night, one 30 or 45 minutes of worship and then another 30 or 45 minutes of, of me bringing the word. So let's just say um, an hour and a half or so. 14 years old and for 14 years she's just wanted to find a way out and absolutely end it and be done. And in one night, in an hour to an hour and a half, God changes all that, opens up her mind. She goes, now that I see that all that trauma was just God allowing that stuff to happen so that I would accept him and let him all the way in tonight. 
and here's what she said that blessed me so much because I've said this before on Truck Church, the conclusion that God brought me to. Joanne, good to see you. LaDemon, good to see y'all. Um, did I miss somebody else? Uh, okay, Miss Turner, good to see you on there. So here was the other conclusion. 14 years of straight trauma, trying to end her life several times, extreme depression, extreme trauma her whole life. And something that I said on Truck Church when we did that uh, What's Your Nine Hours video, she says it just almost verbatim the way that I said it, and it blessed me so much. And she said, um, um, tonight, if everything in my life that's been traumatic, that made me want to take my own life, if all of that stuff, if all it was really meant for was for me to come here tonight to allow Christ to come all the way in and me give him everything, she said, then it was worth it. And I can't tell you what that did to me because that's the same conclusion that God brought to me uh, while I was in prison. If, um, if, um, if I had to go do that 11 years in prison, if, if I had to be involved in my buddy getting uh, murdered, if all that stuff had to happen so that I could come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and get me to the point to where I was ready to receive him and accept him, then it was worth it. The 11 years was absolutely worth it. I came to that conclusion at about 20, 26, 27 years old in prison. This girl is 14 and it comes right out of her mouth without me having to ask her any questions. She said, man, if all the trauma that I ever had to go through was just to lead me up to this night where I would receive Christ and let him all the way in and just give him everything, she said, then it was worth it. It changed her whole, can you imagine 14 years of wanting to kill yourself? Obviously it wasn't the 414, but when she became of age and life started happening, whatever age that was till 14, where every day is a struggle out of her mouth. Every day was a struggle to get out of bed. Every day was a struggle to get up and do something and try to put a smile on. All those years of in the back of your mind or even in the forefront of your mind, just wanting to end everything. And then one of those days you wake up the same way. The one day you wake up, you still don't want to get out of bed. You still don't want to put a smile on your face. You're still uh, struggling just to survive. In, in that same day, God takes an hour to an hour and a half of that afternoon and brings you to a whole nother conclusion of all that stuff was designed just to bring you to me so that you would receive me and, and I could use all of you for your ministry. That blows. I know that principle. God taught it to me, but to hear it come out of a 14 year old, I, that was the highlight of my week. Absolutely. The highlight of my, my, my week. Um, and then I had another one that night and that 11 year old Sarai, the one that said that she struggled getting closer to God because of her confidence. Um, she sent the nut. She's real shy. So another little girl came to me and said, Hey, Sarai wants to talk to you, but she's really shy. And I said, go get her. We'll, we'll sit down. We'll, we'll uh, talk in private or whatever. And, um, so sort of little Sarai comes up smiling. She's like, I really want to talk to you. And she goes, I'm just nervous. And I said, there's no reason to be nervous. Let's just sit down and talk. And so we sit down and it was real short and sweet, but it just hit me right between the eyes. And so we sit down. I said, what would you like to tell me? And she just about three or four sentences. She, she, she said, you're not like other preachers. You don't preach like other preachers. You don't teach like other preachers that I've heard. And she said, I just want you to know that tonight my life is forever changed. And that was it. I asked her if she was done. She said, yes. I said, can I have a hug? And then I'm going to go to the back and cry. <laughs> but an 11 year old, an 11 year old responding to the gospel, an 11 year old saying something different about you. You don't preach like other people preach. You don't teach like other people teach and didn't even tell me what the thing was. She just told me that tonight because of you, the rest of my life is my life is forever changed. An 11 year old man. Why are we struggling to get it at 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years old when these 11 year olds and these 14 year olds are getting it? But anyway, so those were the those were the highlights of my week doing that youth camp. And uh, I left there and I cried the majority of the way home and I'm listening to that 11 year olds um, four sentences over and over and over again. And I'm praying of course. And by the time I, I got into my yard, I told God, I said, God, um, don't let me forget the words of that 11 year old Sarai. I pray that her words ring in my ears for the rest of my life. Um, and one of those reasons is, is because I'm still human. Like I love preaching. I love teaching. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. All that junk that we spend a lot of time wasting, you know, worried about or whatever. But, uh, what'd you say to tell you? They taught us all something that night. Amen. They absolutely did. But, uh, but you know, I still have Sundays and that Thursday was one of them. I can't explain it other than Satan just jacking with me and me not feeling like fighting that day or whatever. Cause some days Satan, some days Satan jacks with me and I, I fight him off and it's no problem or whatever. And I'm glad to do it. 
and there's other days he just hits me at the right time and catches me in the right mood I'm in my feelings or whatever and he wakes me up on a day that I'm going to speak whether it's a Sunday or like that specific Thursday I uh, wasn't feeling good I've had stomach issues for a couple of weeks now or whatever and Thursday I woke up with those and then I woke up in a mood and in my feelings and went to work and wasn't feeling that and and I just struggled all day long with what am I going to share with these kids I feel like I have nothing to offer that is stupid to me because I know how much word God has deposited in me I've been preaching since 2008 in prison and not one time not one single time since 2008 till today 2020 not one single time not one single time have I ever preached and God not shown up and did something? Not one single time. I have absolutely no logic and no truth to line up with that lie to tell Satan, yeah, I agree with you. I've got nothing to offer today. There's no logic in it. I have no experience where God didn't move. Not one single time. Bible study, one-on-one, -on -one, preaching to uh, 20 people, preaching to 3,000 men in Rockwall. Doesn't matter. Not one single time have I ever preached and God didn't move in a mighty way. But in my head, I'm still a man like everybody else, and there's times that I wake up and I feel like I just don't have anything else to give. I just don't have anything to offer. And on that same day, I show up anyway because I'm smart enough uh, to, even when I'm falling into the lies, I'm still smart enough to go. I know that if, if I will honor God and show up, he'll take care of the rest. I know that because he's done it so many times, no matter if I'm fired up, excited, ready to preach, or if I wake up feeling like I have nothing to offer and, and maybe my time doing this is done or whatever the craziness Satan uh, helps me think up. If I'll just show up, I know God's going to do his part. He, absolutely, he is a liar. And so that's what I did Thursday. All the way there, I wasn't feeling it. I, I wasn't wanting to turn around and not go. I just was like, Ugh, I don't know how this is going to go. I don't even know what we're going to talk about yet. And what's crazy is as soon as I get in the room, God starts showing me stuff. I mean, I was there for five minutes and God had already showed me the end of the service, having all the adults praying over the, the kids. I mean, he just wasted no time. Walked in the door and God starts showing up. So, um, but I wake up that day feeling like I had nothing to offer. And by the end of that night, one of the last conversations I have is by an 11 year old girl who says, you don't preach like other preachers. You don't, t you, uh, um, yeah, how'd she say, um, you're not like other preachers. You don't preach like other preachers and you don't teach like other preachers I've heard. And because of you tonight, my life is forever changed. You see how God works? Like I showed up to pour into those kids and I did my best, but at the end of the day, I left there being poured into by those kids. And that was the most amazing thing. I wake up that morning thinking I got nothing to offer. By the end of that night, an 11 year old is telling me, you're not like other preachers. You don't preach like other preachers. You don't teach like other preachers. And because of that, my life is forever changed. An 11 year old. And then I hear a 14 year old say, if all my trauma that's made me want to end my life all these years was just to lead me to the moment where I would accept Christ and let him work through me fully, then it was worth it. To hear those two things, I prayed all the way home that night. Let those voices ring in my ears all the days of my life. Don't ever let me forget those two conversations with those two girls that night. Vicki, Guillermo and I are here. We love and miss you. Oh, I love you guys so much. Hey, I did another wedding today. Made me think of you guys. <laughs> Second time I wore the cowboy stuff. So now that I've spent 30 minutes of your time uh, not preaching the sermon that I wanted to preach, um, are you guys ready to get into the word? Maybe, uh, maybe I won't keep you too long. Um, so here we go. So I heard some stuff in church today. Again, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, but God always shows up. He gives us stuff or whatever. So from the wedding to the lake here, asking God, what are we going to talk about? It shot me back to a couple of things that my pastor had said this morning that's been with me all day, even though my day's been chaotic and busy and running and going. It's still been on the back of my mind every time I have a few quiet seconds. So uh, I want to read one, two, three, four, five. I want to read three, or f uh, about four or five verses to you. Uh, that was a blessing. Thank you for sharing. Amen. Amen. God bless you, bro. So I want to share a few things. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is going to be uh, you were preaching, brother. <laughs> okay. Amen. So uh, if there's a title of this message, it's going to be called uh, Be Not Deceived. Okay. So I want to read four or five verses to you just to prove the point of, and these are just a few. There was, there's probably 50 or more, but these are big ones to me where God goes out of his way through different people to tell us not to be deceived and tells us to uh, be beware of not being deceived so uh, I want to read a few to you before I actually get to the the, the the meat scripture that I want to go over okay so if you'll turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 
uh, these first four just stay ready to flip because we're going to read them. I might make a couple of comments and then we're going to keep on going. So we're not going to stay in, on any of these first ones very long. There's just one scripture that we're going to stay on and hit for a minute. So if you will flip to Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. I heard a guy say one time, the only thing bad about being deceived is you don't know it because you're deceived. <laughs> And that is so true. The only thing bad about being deceived is you don't know it because you're deceived. Just getting here. We'll catch on the replay. We're actually just getting started, Renee. If you, I just shared some testimonies and some stories. You can catch the replay or you can keep riding now if you want to. We're just now getting to the message, actually. Um, be not deceived. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. So stay ready to flip with me. We're going to hit four or five verses and then stop on one and preach that thing down. Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. I, that's the verse. I don't want to get on a long uh, tangent. But uh, I thought I was done talking about current events and all this stuff. Um, but I'm just, we're in the middle of it. I'm going to have to hit on. I'm going to have to address it. I'm going to have to upset some people and make some people mad and get unfriended and all that good fun stuff. But um, it just is what it is. There's a couple of things I've absolutely got to bring up. There's a couple of things that's going to be very controversial that we've got to talk about or whatever, but you know, it just is what it is. Cameron, it's good to see you on here, buddy. A good friend of mine I just had lunch with. We're becoming good friends. Uh, he's also a minister as well. So um, I'm not going to hit on this one long. All I want to stop and say is, is let's filter the current events that you know, and then I'm going to bring up a couple that you may or may not know. It just depends on how deep you get into stuff. Um, a couple of them were very new to me. My pastor brought them up this morning and it just hit me hard. I didn't know what the message was going to be tonight, but I knew that I was going to have to at least bring them up. So Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So we're doing all this crazy stuff in the streets and uh, whether we're doing it in the name of God, whether we're doing it in the name of uh, religion, whether we're doing it in the name of racism or looting or uh, Black Lives Matter or whatever you want to put the label on, God's not mocked. People are saying, where is God? Other people are saying God is here and, and he's just tarrying, which is really what's going on. But whatever the reason is that people are doing all this crazy stuff, God is not uninformed. He's not um, surprised by what's going on. He's watching. He has a plan and a purpose for all of it. What we need to be guarded on, what we need to be making sure that we're doing is that we're uh, we're taking care of our business and being about our father's business while this stuff is going on because there's some crazy insane stuff that just happened over the last two or three weeks but my encouragement to you is is god don't be deceived god is not mocked what these people are doing what they're what they're reap what they're sowing they're gonna reap it's not our job to figure it all out and uh, cast judgment all over the place there's going to be a day where this stuff is paid for either in this life the next however you want to word it but the point is, is don't be deceived. God is not mocked. He is in total control of even the chaos that's going on right now. Believe that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. We're just going to read a couple of scriptures about being deceived before we talk about deception. But 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. And you'll understand more while we're hitting on these deception verses when we get to the main one because I've got about three or four points I want to make on it about current events. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Let's read it again. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every principle. Do not believe everything that's being taught. Do not believe every speaker. Do not believe every preacher. Do not believe every teacher. Do not believe every motivational speaker. Don't believe every advocate. Don't believe every activist. Don't believe everybody that's got a platform. You need to test the spirits of everything that's being said. Because if you don't, and you get blindsided or you get blinded by the uh, the platform of a certain speaker, their clout, their fame, and you start believing everything you say just because, oh, so-and-so said this, surely they wouldn't lie to us. You're going to be deceived. And we're going to hit on a couple things that are being done right now that I can't even believe we're having to talk about. But it's coming out of the mouth of preachers, so we're going to have to cover it. 
So um, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, test those things that are being taught, test those principles, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. False prophets. Oh, man. There's false prophets, and then they're just, man, God forgive me, there's false prophets, yeah, and then they're just morons, brother. Just morons out there that have a platform, and people are following it because so-and-so said so. Um, Colossians chapter 2 and false teachings. Ray, wait till I tell you something here in just a second, dude. Just hang on. Right, give me about five minutes. We'll get there, Ray. Just insane what people are saying. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Ready? Beware lest, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Let's read it again. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. You've got a whole lot of people that are speaking truth right now, and none of what, is, what they're saying, none of what's coming out of their mouth has anything to do with uh, biblical teaching, it has nothing to do with what God says. Um, we're going to end up talking about Black Lives Matter here in a minute. Um, sorry, we're just going to have to, and I know I got some Christian friends that struggle with that. And these two stupid slogans, uh, do all lives matter or do black lives matter? And depending on if you say one of them, then you're automatically a racist. Doesn't matter what you have to say. And if you say the other one, you're politically correct because it's just this big thing right now. But we'll talk about that here in a minute. But because it's popular, because you've got some people that can get up and speak eloquently and things like that, you can't get lost in people's words and their eloquence. eloquence. Listen to what they're saying. And if the Bible doesn't back it up, you don't have to call them a false teacher, a, f a false prophet. You don't have to label them anything. All you need to know is that is not why, what lines up with the Word of God, and that is not what we follow. Don't get caught up in the hype. Don't get caught up in what's uh, common. Don't get caught up on the bandwagon, what everybody else is following. What does the Word of God say? Because God spends about 40 or 50 verses telling his Christian um, sons and daughters, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the truth. I'm the truth. This word of God is truth. This word has the power unto salvation. This is truth. Jesus is truth. You got a whole bunch of people that are Given all, I know I'm being very general right now because I'm trying not to jump ahead of myself, but there's so many things that are coming out as truth right now, and they sound good. If you listen to a person who is half educated that is preaching this Black Lives Matter campaign, they will tell you, they'll even use uh, passages of scripture. They'll say, It's not that all lives don't matter, it's that Black Lives Matter because we're the ones in trouble right now. That sounds really good. And to your average person, they're going to say, you know what, you're right. I understand what you're saying. And then they'll back it up. They'll even pick a parable and they'll say, it's like Jesus, uh, 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 the, um, the the shepherd. When, whenever, whenever one sheep went astray, he left the 99 and went after that one. See, that proves, that proves. You go after the one that's hurting. You go after the one that's in trouble. That has, that, the context of that has absolutely nothing to do with the slogan of what Black Lives Matter represents. And I'm going to harp on that a lot because that is a big thing right now. Um, I'm probably going to start speaking on it more openly and more publicly and probably doing a lot of videos on that. There's something that got triggered in me today that um, punctured me to the core. Uh, I stay out of politics a lot. Um, they're not super important to me because my focus has always been Romans chapter 13 tells me to submit to my authority as long as they're not asking me to do anything outside of what the Bible teaches. But today, something in that changed. I'm not fixing to be a politician. I'm not fixing to run for office. <laughs> I don't think I could anyway. But um, I'm fixing to start speaking on and tackling those things that we don't want to talk about anymore, especially us Christians. So, uh, and you used the one I had. Yeah, Bill, you did send me that. And you know what? Before you sent me that, I had never heard anybody use that as their justification. Since you sent me that, I have seen that probably uh, 200 times, man. And I've had that conversation with people on the phone uh, several, several times. Um, I've got one more friend that I promised to have a conversation with. And now that I know some of this other stuff, 
I was already going to meet with them, but now I really have to meet with them because it's a dear friend of mine and they are big time advocate of this thing. Um, I've got to do some more studying and some research so I can go in with guns blazing. I know how I feel about it when it comes to the word of God, but I realized there were some things underneath that, um, that mantra of Black Lives Letter that I did not know. And once I heard them this morning, a switch flipped and it's just time to uh, aim my gifts at that right there and start educating um, Christians on what's going on. So uh, Romans chapter 16. So probably going to start losing some friends here in the next several weeks to months or whatever. But I'm not going to say that I don't care because I love people and I love friendships and relationships. But at this point in my life, um, truth means more to me than anything. And so if I lose friends, um, I'm going to lose them and not be offended. Uh, pray for them. Hopefully they'll come back. If they don't come back, it's not that I don't care. It's I'm just at a different place in my life. Where I'm at in my life right now is it's all about truth. I have a, I have a passion uh, for truth right now and getting truth out there. I, I don't want to be ignorant. I don't want my friends, my brothers and sisters to be ignorant. The Bible tells us don't be deceived 40 or 50 times. Um, there are people that are just lost out there. Uh, you can't lose true friendships. Uh, that's true, right? That's that's right, brother. But you know how it is. Truth is uh, offensive, and it doesn't matter how logical or Bible-based something is. Um, when somebody comes to an argument or a debate, and all they have as a foundation is their feelings and their emotions, they're not going to walk away with a change of thought due to truth and logic they're going to walk away offended because their foundation was their feelings. So they feel like you're attacking their feelings. They don't recognize that you're bringing them uh, truth and gospel. And therefore the Bible says, don't be deceived. So when your foundation is feelings and emotions, no matter what the debate is, whatever the topic is, whatever you're trying to figure out in your life, when your foundation is feelings and emotions, um, you fit into the category of being deceived. That's what the Bible's talking about. Don't be deceived. What is truth? Don't be deceived. Truth. Ah. So, ah. <laughs> I could get on a soapbox. Drives me nuts. Man. I don't know whether to blame us or blame the churches, but we have fallen into the pattern of going to church, listening to whatever the preacher has to say, we don't challenge it, one, because we don't know already, and two, we don't challenge it because we're too lazy to go back home and look it up and see and test that spirit to see if he was right. Some of your pastors are going to tell you the absolute truth. Some pastors are going to uh, tell you the truth and be deceiving you on purpose. Some people are going to, I'm sorry, uh, some people are going to think, know they're not teaching the truth on purpose trying to deceive you and then you got those in the middle who are believing that they're speaking truth but actually are taking something out of context or um, didn't study it all the way out and they say something wrong their motives were completely pure so you've got a pastor that's speaking truth and knows he is you got a pastor that's speaking thinks he's speaking truth but he's teaching something false those two people we can work with that and then you've got people that are knowing that they're teaching wrong and they've got motives behind it Two of those people is exactly why you need to learn to test the spirits and learn what you need to know. Another thing is, and I'm going to try to circle back to what we're talking about here. The Bible says in Revelations that in the end times that they overcame, um, they overcame him, talking about the adversary. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, loving not their lives unto the death. Well, it always struck me as odd is how come it never listed the word of God there? And the reason why I believe that that is true is because there's going to come a day and, and it's creeping up on us pretty quick there's going to come a day to where uh, the word of god is not going to be legal it's not going to be a legal thing it's going to be illegal to have a bible i know that seems far-fetched because you've always had a bible somewhere in your house collecting dust or whatever but there's going to come a day to where your bible is going to be illegal and that if you're caught with it it's going to be a crime uh it could be a fine at first it could be incarceration after that and then there'll be a day to where uh, like it is overseas to where it's going to cost you your life if we, if we live long enough to see those days, those days are coming and they're coming more and more rapidly. So I think, I believe that's why in the Bible it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony, loving not their life unto the death. It never mentioned that we overcame him by the word of God, which is crazy to me because the word of God is everything. But if the word of God is no longer legal at that time, it makes perfect sense why the Bible would say the word of their testimony and the blood of the lamb. 
because we won't even have this physical word besides what we've hid in our heart to overcome him by. But anyway, that's just a, a, a theory of mine um, that I base on certain things. Um, there's so much deception being taught. Blame the churches, blame the preachers, blame us as Christians, whatever you want to blame. But we are, have gotten into this routine of going to church, whatever the preacher offers that day, we yes and we amen and we leave with that as truth. Hopefully you're in a church where you've got a guy that spends endless time making sure he's preaching the truth and you're good. But like I said, there's going to be pastors that are deceiving on purpose and there's going to be pastors that believe they're teaching the truth, but it wasn't all the way studied out. Uh, they're bringing you a doctrine that they learned from time they were a kid or they're they're actually teaching you something that they learned in seminary not something that they looked up or studied so it's not always necessarily true we have become a lazy congregation and we don't go back and test the spirits because surely the pastor would not lie to us or deceive us well you got some that are deceiving on purpose and some that are are, are deceiving um negligently they're not trying to they just are the point is is you're supposed to go back and test the spirits because the bible tells you to to go back and test the spirits um where are we at romans chapter 16 verse 17 and 18 i'm getting ahead of myself romans chapter 16 verse 17 and 18 now i urge you brethren note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoided them, and avoid them for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Let's read it again. That's a good one. Verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. You've got people that are just starting a, starting wars and riots and starting controversies. And that's in the church, that's in the world, it's all over the place. But they're doing all this stuff to deceive the simple. You've got people that are screaming, um, here's something that's not logical at all. If you're a Trump supporter, you're a white supremacist. I heard somebody say that today. If you support Trump, you're a white supremacist. And I can name two or three black friends of mine off the top of my head that are Trump supporters. And I'm pretty sure that my black friends are not white supremacists. So I'm not sure why that guy said that. Another thing is, is uh, because they say Trump is uh, um, a racist and he hates black people and all this stuff. And that's why Black Lives Matters exist. Uh, whatever. If you do your history, you'll find out that the Republicans are the ones who ended slavery. Democrats are the ones that were pushing for slavery. And if we ever get all the Democrats voted back in again, they're going to eventually try to get us over to socialism, which is all that's going to be is a modern day slavery for everybody. So my black friends and black people that don't even know me that are hating on Trump or Republicans and they're pushing for the Black Lives Matter and they're pushing for Democrats to do this, they don't even know because they haven't spent the time to research history or anything that they're, they're screaming racist at this one guy hoping that a whole nother political system will come in, not knowing that that political system is fixing to put them right back into the slavery that they're protesting. Does that make sense? I want to say I don't care who the, is in the presidency, but I, but I do. The, the, the motives, the laws that can change, I, I, I do care. What I mean is I don't spend a lot of time on who's in the office because the word of God tells me in Romans 13 that I'm supposed to submit to whoever is in authority because God ordains whoever is there, whether they're a Christian or not. So whoever's our, our, um, our president, I'm going to pray for whether I like them or I don't. What I'm saying is, is we've got black lives matters over here. They're trying to convince everybody that if you say all lives matter, you're a racist. Okay. Because it's not all lives matter. The black people are the ones that are struggling right now, so they're, they're who really matters. Well, that doesn't line up with Scripture because Jesus says that he died once for all. He died once for all, and he didn't name a, a race. He didn't name um, even a gender. He didn't name anything. The Bible says, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. And the Bible also says one man died for all. One man died for all. So what the Bible teaches is, is all lives matter. 
doesn't matter if the whites are being suppressed. It doesn't matter if the Hispanics are being suppressed. It doesn't matter if the, uh, the blacks, African Americans, whichever one is politically correct for the day, if they're being, it does not matter. The Bible teaches that one man died for all. So it absolutely is all lives matter. Why? Because all lives matter to Jesus and I care a whole lot more about what he says and what he teaches and what he thinks than I do somebody that's offended for something that never happened to them. I don't know a man today who has ever been a slave. I don't know a man today who has ever owned a slave. And people jumped on me last time for talking about this, saying that we're not talking about slavery, we're talking about racism, and we're talking about how rough the cops are on black people more so than whites and Hispanics. Uh, miss me with all that crap. Um, I'm just to the point now to where I'm gonna call it what it is, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but if you don't understand that media is aimed to deceive you and stir up hatred and stir up racism, you and I cannot have a conversation uh, because there's more to teach you than what I can teach you. But if you haven't learned yet in all these years of your life that the media um, is directly pushed, uh, financed, and persuaded by politics, then you and I can't sit down and have a logical conversation. Of course you're going to believe that um, only black lives matter, and of course you're going to believe that there is more abuse on black people or African Americans more than any other. Of course you're going to believe that because that's all the media shows. But if you play around on Google or if you want to play around on YouTube or whatever, you'll see that actually the numbers of blacks being um, treated more harsh than cops is actually the lowest number. It's actually whites and Hispanics that are. But how come you can't find that on the media? Well, because that's not what you want to believe because we're not going to write about that stuff. So anyway, we're, we're slowly getting on a tangent. I'll reel it back in just a little bit. The point is, is that if you say you're a Trump supporter, then all of a sudden now I'm a white supremacist, which is stupid. I've had more trouble with white people in my life than I have any other race. So uh, I'm not a white supremacist. Um, number two, you're wanting to get the Republicans out of office so that you can get your Democrats because they're out there saying um, that they're going to help you know black people and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. That's great. But those Democrats that are saying that they're going to help uh, the black community and African community are pushing for so socialism and socialism is going to bring about all kinds of slavery for all kinds of races and then we're all going to be screwed and there's no longer democracy and you're not going to get to vote and you're not going to get to change anything and you're going to really feel the, the slavery and the racism that you're preaching about like you know about but you don't because uh, you've never been a slave and you've never owned one and neither have I that stuff happened 150 180 years ago or whatever but you're still offended and you're telling me that I need to pay for what happened to your ancestors and where you came up with that I'm not real sure either but anyway um, you want Trump and Republicans out of the office so that you can bring the Democrats in because they're promising to help your people. But you're deceived because you haven't done your research and your people are going to bring about socialism, which is going to put all of us in slavery. And then once you finally realize that you were wrong and now we're in slavery and then you want to start screaming your Black Lives Matter stuff, uh, then you're going to go to jail or you'll be executed or, or uh, whatever. Right? There will be no voice for you and you can do your rights and protest and then all you want to whether you're white black or hispanic and they'll probably just gun you down in the streets and uh they'll bury you in some unmarked grave but by the time socialism comes it won't matter what you're thinking and uh, right now they're allowing you to ride and they're allowing you to protest and they're allowing you to scream and spread your hatred because you're pushing their agenda it makes the republicans look bad your democrats are going to get voted in once we vote them in and the same time you're screaming yes we win you're very your days are numbered before we're all slaves again and uh, you didn't get your wish and then your protesting won't matter because then you'll get shot in the face when you decide to protest you need to do your research okay the bible says do not be deceived 40 to 50 times for a reason for a reason jason you have such a unique ministry yeah i'm a little throwed off sometimes bro but um i'm just passionate man i'm passionate about truth sherry good to see you girl so um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy, and I swear I'm not on a tangent. I'm not mad before um, I try not to get wrapped up in a lot of worldly stuff. I try not to get wrapped up in political stuff because what I can change, I try to change. What I, what I, what I can't change, I don't worry about. Politics has never been a big deal to me until today. 
because uh, I see how big a deal it has to be cut. And the only reason it became a big deal to me today is because now I see the deception. I see the deception in my friends. I see the deception in the church. I see how stuff like this is going to uh, start separating people. It's going to start separating Christians. Um, Christians are saying some of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life that have nothing to do with God, the gospel, scriptures at all. I don't know where the junk is even coming from. Um, anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. Let's read that because I, I, the next verse is the meaty one. Uh, I'm trying to preach, bro. I'm trying to be frustrated too. I'm not going to apologize for what I'm saying. Um, um, what I'm saying is really what I feel. Again, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm not trying to be uh, rude or anything like that. I'm just tired of stupidity. Um, I don't mind being confronted, and I'm going to be confronted after this video too, and it's fine. Like I always say, hit me up, message me, text me, shoot me your phone number. I'll get on the phone with you. It's all good stuff. Uh, I'm ready to go. It ain't going to be a fight. If we have to scream and yell, I'll end the conversation because I'm not into screaming and yelling. But I'm telling you, if you reach out to me and you tell me we're going to talk, let's talk but bring some truth with you bring some logic with you bring some facts and statistics and please bring the word of god do not spend my time on the phone um, with how you feel and how you think do not bring your feelings and your emotions to me if we're going to have this conversation it's already going to be a hard conversation but if you're going to bring this conversation to me you bring some truth with you do not spend my time let me say it like this my time is valuable i love my time and i love having people do not waste my time with your feelings and your emotions, okay? I'm not going to waste my time with you. My stuff is going to be backed up with what the Word of God says. So uh, that's just my clause for the people that wanted to uh, call me out or whatever, and that's fine. I won't be offended when you call me out. As long as you ain't screaming and yelling and cussing me out on the phone, we're good. I can have a conversation. But uh, I'm not preaching out of offense today. I'm... A little bit upset but not in my feelings upset I'm upset that I don't even know what I'm upset at really I don't know how we came to this part I don't know how churches have come to the place to where we're so deceived and blind to truth I don't know I'm getting ahead of myself let's read this verse and then I'll preach my guts out real quick 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verse 13 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Boy, isn't that scary? There's people that are going to be deceiving on purpose. And what's crazy about it is in their deceiving people, they are going to be deceived as well. Isn't that crazy? The, there's going to be people and imposters that are out there with the agenda to deceive. Democrats, okay, let me hear you one time. They're going to be deceiving on purpose, not knowing that even in their deceiving, they are being deceived. What does that mean? It means that they think they know the truth. They think they know what is the greater good. But even thinking they know the greater good and the truth, they're going to be deceiving. Not knowing that the whole time that they are deceived, that's like twice as scary. Read that again. Uh, verse 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let's just get to the meat. Go to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, and you'll see why I'm so passionate tonight. This is what we preached on. This is what my pastor preached on today. I've missed a whole bunch of comments. I'm sorry. It seems like it's already happening. The deceivers are deceived themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've got good friends. I'm talking good friends that I love to death that are on the bandwagon, stop apologizing for the truth you speak. I didn't realize I did apologize, but if I did, good correction. Um, as long as it's truth, I won't apologize. Um, I've got good, good, good friends, man. Good friends, good friends that I know I'm gonna hear from this week that are on this Black Lives Matter. What'd you say, Mom? Black Lives Matter does not represent all black people. That's true. The black people that do not support Black Lives Matter are called Uncle Toms and other names. Yeah, I've seen that too. Uh, the black people that knows the outcome of Black Lives Matter, once it's stopped, they want all the lawbreakers arrested. Okay, well, let, let me tell you something here. And about I got two or three points in front of this one, but I learned something else about Black Lives Matter this morning that just set me on fire, man. That's why I want to start speaking about it because I'm going to learn everything I can over the next couple of weeks and I'm just going to start shooting stuff out there and exposing it. 
and uh, take whatever heat comes with it. So here we go. Uh, turn in your Bibles. Let's preach this thing out. Matthew chapter 24. This is what my pastor hit on this morning. Uh, I'm not going to hit it the same way he hit it, but he said some stuff that just got me stirred up in a good way. So Matthew chapter 24. Get there, get there, get there. Matthew chapter 24. And then you're going to find out right now why I'm fired up and passionate uh, tonight. Okay, here we go. Y'all ready? Recommendation, UncleTom.com. All right. Here we go. Is that an actual website, Nick, I'm guessing? Recommendation, UncleTom.com. Okay, here we go. Y'all ready? I've still got everybody here. This is amazing. Thank y'all for staying here, not leaving. Um, here we go. Matthew chapter 24. Let's read verses 3 through 11 real quick, and then I want to hit four points. Read a couple more verses, hit three points, and we're done. Okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 11. Here we go. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Verse 4. I got to spit my gum out because I'm fixing them. Get crazy, probably. Okay. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Here we go again. Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. That before today, I thought, how crazy is that, that Christians that are looking for Christ to return are going to fall for somebody that is not Christ when he returns. But now with all this crazy, silly stuff that's going on in our world, I absolutely can see why somebody's going to believe that. Because we're deceived. Verse 6, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. That's another reason why I try not to get wrapped up in all the, the wars, rumors of wars, protests, all that stuff. As soon as that stuff started happening, I'm already thinking about the Bible said that these things must happen. These things are going to usher in the presence of God. So I can't get too wrapped up in them. What I got to be wrapped up in is doing my best to use my gifts and talents to promote truth to those that could be deceived. If I can get to those that could be deceived and get truth, there's some of those people that are going to get the truth and they'll be prepared before the deceiver comes and deceives them. I won't get everybody, but uh, those of us who know truth, we have a responsibility to, uh, to be speaking truth. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. You ain't seen nothing yet. Verse 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. That day's coming too. And then many will be offended. Oh my goodness, hello. And many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Can you see how just, there's lots of topics to talk about, but just me and several of my friends, I've got friends of every race that there is, but just deciding which side of the fence you want to be on with the Black Lives Matter, can you see how just that one agenda right there is going to start dividing friends and families and churches just that one and we're just getting started good we ain't even got to the hot stuff we ain't even got to the tribulation stuff we're just getting warmed up now and we just got this one hot juicy topic all uh, uh black lives matter and can you already see no matter which side of the fence you decide to be on how that's going to start separating people and offending people and uh ending friendships and relationships and breaking down churches shutting down churches can can you see it already that's just one we're just getting started we're not even into the the heat of tribulation we're not even into the heavy stuff we're not into the the bowls of judgment we're not into anything hot and heavy we're just getting warmed up we're just getting started good and boom we've already got this one slogan black lives matter and depending on what comes out of your mouth friendships are going to end churches are going to split families are going to split up just this one we can't handle this one and we haven't even got to the hot stuff yet um 
Verse 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So here we go. Let's make four good points real quick. Here's four things that are going on right now. Um, I, I'll read the comments later. I love you guys. Thank you for what you're saying, no matter what it is. <clears throat> so many are going to be deceived. We've already read several scriptures. This is talking about end times. People that are coming up are going to be speaking. Uh, matter of fact, even when they the antichrist comes to, to show himself as christ people are going to believe it because they're deceived why are we deceived because we don't know our word because we go to church on sunday and we listen to what the preacher has to say and we all leave there lazy talking about what a good sermon it was and we don't test the spirits and we don't, uh, what chapter that was matthew chapter 24 we read matthew chapter 24 verses 3 through 11 is what we've covered so far right there dina we go to church, we hear the word of God, we leave there, we never test the spirits. We're just trusting the guy that's up there. And I'm not telling you to start some friction with your pastor. I love my pastor. And I believe like 98.7% of everything he says, the stuff that we don't agree on is not heaven or hell stuff, so it doesn't bother me. And I don't feel the need to raise my hand and say, well, I think this. And, and I know he doesn't agree with everything that I teach, and he doesn't, do, he doesn't do that to me either, because on the main stuff, the important stuff we agree on, the stuff that we disagree on is not even worth, you know, having an argument on or whatever. But whenever you're not versed in the Bible or, or you're not really sure what's going on, most people on a Sunday morning hear the pastor leave there and don't test the spirits. Whenever the Bible has told you, doesn't matter who's in the pulpit, doesn't matter how long you know them, doesn't matter how long your friendship or relationship has has been it doesn't matter how long they've been on tv it doesn't matter how famous that pastor is it doesn't matter the bible says very plain and clear test the spirits to see if they are of the word of god test the spirit you're told you're told to test the spirits and we don't test the spirits so that's how whenever the antichrist comes we're going to be deceived and we'll follow the antichrist because we don't know the word of god all we know is we heard a preacher say one time that jesus is coming back this dude said he's Jesus. That's the guy my pastor was talking about. And then you follow him because you have no idea what it's supposed to be like when the Antichrist comes. You have no idea. So here's something real quick. Jamie, uh, what'd you say? I was just talking about these very same things. Me and you were always on the same page. Always. So here's the deal. So I come from a very heavy Baptist background. And I'm not going to bash Baptists, Methodists, none of them. I've been to all of them. I've preached at all of them. They have their reasons why they are different denominations and, and, and all that good stuff, and we could preach about all that. I'm none of those denominations any longer. Um, but here's, here's the deal. The Baptist denominations are one of the largest denominations in the world as far as Christianity goes. Something I learned today is that when, when, when things have happened in past wars and stuff, when the country is falling apart and wanting to divide and all this stuff, and everybody else started turning away from gospel teaching and going with whatever the government wanted or whatever society wanted up till this point the baptists were the ones that put their feet in the ground and refused to budge and what and what has kept this country um a christian nation for as long as it has because of how hardcore um how strong of spines baptists have had okay so now here we go i can't remember the guy's name it's jd something something but he's the president of the, I don't know if I can say this right, uh, because I know there's Baptists and there's like different sects of uh, Baptists, you know, first Baptist, second Baptist, and blah, 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 blah. But let me say this just so I can be safe. I'm not going to see the the president of over all Baptists everywhere because I'm sure that's not how it works. But just one of the biggest sections of the Baptist denomination, okay? One of the biggest sections of the Baptist denomination who has mega influence across the United States, if not the world, the president of the Baptist denomination came out recently and said, the, the God that we serve and the God that the Muslims serve are the same God. If that doesn't bother you, you're deceived. If you agree with what he said, you're deceived. If you don't think it's that big of a deal, you're deceived. I'm just telling you straight up. I hope that mad face is not aimed at me. I hope it's for what I just said. Um, if it's aimed at me, hit me up. We'll talk. The president of the Baptist organization has come out to say, uh, most likely Southern Baptist Association probably is, um, I should I should have listened harder at that point because now I'm, I'm uh, 
trying to prove the point and I'm getting hung up on exactly what part. All I know is he is a Baptist and he's the president of a big section of the organization. So a president of some Baptist association has come out and said that the same God that Christian serves is the same God that Muslims serve. J.D. Greer, Southern Baptist. There we go, Chris Means. So um, I have an issue with that. And I'm not harping on the point of him being Baptist. Of course, y'all y'all know me better than that. It wouldn't have mattered if it was the Methodist person or if it was the Presbyterian or what. It doesn't matter. Any Christian at all should have never said that. But any, any Christian that has any type of platform of influence surely should have never said that the God of the Christians and the God of Muslims, they're the same God. But now here we go, let's just take Baptist off the off the deal. Doesn't even matter what denomination he came from. The point is, is he's a Christian, he's a preacher, he's a pastor, he's got mega influence in the Christian world, and this guy has just come out and said, the same God that we serve is the same God that the Muslims serve, okay? The God of the Bible um, sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die one time for all of humanity. People are not going to go to hell because of their sin. People are going to go to hell because they reject the free gift of salvation um, that Jesus Christ offers. The Bible very plainly says that all sin was paid for on the cross. Okay? The God of the Quran, the God of Islam, his name is Allah. Allah means moon God. Um, that God, that Quran, their Bible says that Jesus was a good teacher and that he was a magnificent prophet, but he was not the son of God. And it says that he did not die on the cross. What might have happened, the Quran says, is that there was a body switch, that someone died on the cross, but God surely couldn't kill his own son. By the way, Jesus is not God's son. And by the way, Jesus is only a good teacher, an amazing prophet. But he's not the son of God, number one. And number two, he didn't die on the cross because Christians wouldn't let that happen. There was a body switch and somebody else died on the cross. You tell me how the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran, the God of the Christians and the God of the Muslims are one and the same. You tell me that just with that little bit of 50 cent bit of doctrine that I just gave you. And I could go on and on and on and on and on. But that's the bit. If you take Jesus out of the equation and you say he's not the son of God and you say that he didn't die on the cross, I'm wasting my time preaching right now this very second on truck church. And we've wasted every Sunday and every Wednesday and every revival and every camp meeting and every youth group meeting and every church thing we've ever done and every worship song we've ever sang. I'm, we've wasted it all If that's if you take that away. We've wasted every second of anything Christian we've ever done. If you take Jesus away from being the son of God and you take him off the cross and say he didn't die. We, all Christian things we just wasted, okay? So don't tell me that Jesus was not the son of God and that he didn't die on the cross. But you know what? The God of the Bible and the God of the Quran are the same thing. And I'm not going to apologize that today either because I've got Muslim friends and I've got Hindu friends and I've got all that. And I've got a couple of Muslim friends that watch this. And that's fine. I still love you. I still love you. What you believe is not true. Sorry. But don't tell me. Don't tell me that the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran, the God of the Christians and the God of the Muslims is one of the same. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're deceived. You're deceived. You're deceived. And the Bible says 40 to 50 times, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. How are you going to keep from being deceived? By getting in this and learning truth. And whenever some preacher stands up and says, the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran or the God of the Christians and the God of the Moses, they're one and the same. You can, you can know that you know that you know that it does not matter what his position is. It doesn't matter what his title is. It doesn't matter how famous he is. You know that you know that you know in that moment in your heart that that is false doctrine and that is false teaching. And then you can tell all those that you know what the truth is. Or you can get caught up in his clout and in his position and his theological seminary degree and say, oh, he knows more than me. He studied more than me. You don't need to study a whole bunch. Your Bible tells you that Jesus was the son of God and he died on the cross. And the Muslims say that Jesus was not the son of God. He was an amazing prophet and he did not die on the cross. There was a body switch. Don't you tell me that we serve the same God. I don't serve a moon God. I serve the God who created the moon, the sun and the stars. So you go worship the moon God if that's what you want to do. 
I'm going to worship the guy who made the moon and the sun and the stars. Don't tell me that we worship the same God. Don't be deceived. I'm not mad at that preacher. I'm not going off on that preacher. I'm mad that the church is deceived enough to where when a guy stands up and says something like that, most congregations are going to say amen because a big wig preacher said that our gods are one and the same. And our, I'm mad because our churches and us Christians don't have enough truth in us to hear that and say, hold on a second, hold on a second. All Baptists are not alike, all believe the same. Yeah, I understand that, I understand that. The point is, is that a Baptist preacher, and it doesn't matter that he was Baptist, a preacher stood up and said, our God and Muslim gods are one and the same, and they're absolutely not. And people amen that and feel that away. It's not all Baptist, and it's not all Methodists, not whatever. Matter of fact, um, the, uh, the Methodist congregations have voted in the last couple of years that now they are going to allow um, homosexual priests to pastor churches and stuff. Um, we know what the Bible says about that. Here's the thing that really blesses me, though. In Africa, those Methodists in Africa totally depend on the money coming from the American Methodist churches. And whenever the Methodist churches decided to implement that and start allowing homosexual pastors to pastor their flocks, the African Methodist churches says, no, we're not going to do that, even if that means that we don't take or receive your money anymore. I'm not bashing all Methodists. I'm just giving an example. The Methodist church decided they were going to allow homosexual pastors. But the convictions of the Methodist churches in Africa who die for their faith over there, they die for their faith. They die for their truth. You think they're going to water down the truth and be like, yeah, we'll do that. They're not going to die for that because it doesn't line up with the word of God. You've got churches of all denominations doing crazy, insane things. And we can go down all the religions and all the denominations, and we can talk about Jehovah Witnesses. And Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses will tell you that we serve the same God. Um, Mormons will tell you that we serve the same God. Jehovah Witnesses take John chapter 1, verse 1, where the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jehovah Witnesses say, in the, they change the Word of God and they change one letter and it changes all the doctrine of the Bible. Jehovah Witnesses, their Bible in John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They just, Boom, they just separated the two. Our Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I can break all that down in a whole other sermon. Don't let me, don't let me rabbit trail. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jehovah Witnesses Bible says, and the Word, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Now we've got a God, and we've got a Jesus God, okay? You just changed the doctrine of the Bible, so therefore, oh, I'm back, okay, good, Woo. We We don't serve the same Jesus. Mormons say, we believe the same Jesus you do, because we have the Bible just like you do. We just happen to read this book of mormons along with it <clears throat> the problem is excuse me getting fired up today problem is in your book of mormons you teach that jesus and michael the archangel are one and the same the problem is is you teach that jesus was the first created being and then satan was the second created being and that jesus and satan are brothers um sorry um Jesus and Satan are not brothers. Um, sorry, Jesus and Michael the Archangel are not one and the same. Sorry, Mormons, we don't serve the same Jesus. What I'm telling you is if you don't know your facts, if you don't know the truth, there's a reason why the Bible says 50 times, do not be deceived. Because if you don't know what you're talking about, a Mormon is going to come up to you and convince you that we serve the same Jesus. And then here's what we do. As a matter of fact, not only is God real, but did you know that you can be a God one day and it's going to sound real good to you? And who wouldn't want to be a God one day? Let's do this thing. And Jehovah Witnesses, God bless them. They feel like they're doing the right thing because the thing about Jehovah Witnesses that they have over any other faith in the world to me, more, uh, Muslims are, are pretty close. Um, but Jeho as far as the the Christian faiths or whatever you want to call it now that I've said that, um, they study a million times harder than anybody else in the Christian world. Jehovah Witnesses study, I mean, can rattle off dates and 
kings and all kinds of stuff to you whenever you sit down and talk. They know their stuff. So just being in their presence intimidates the average Christian because they can't debate with them. So your mind naturally defaults to this guy or girl happens to know a whole lot. I can't debate them. They must be telling the truth because I cannot refute it. There's a reason why the Bible says 50 times or even more, do not be deceived. But the only way you're not going to be deceived is that if you know the truth. Moving on, we'll get off the, the pastor because people are starting to think that I'm harping on certain denominations and I'm not. He, the dude just happened to be a Baptist preacher. I grew up Baptist. <clears throat> anyway, point number two. California has now passed a law that um, you can still go to church and you can still show up for worship, but you can't sing out loud. How did that happen? How are there Christians in California and a law gets passed to now they are controlling what happened to the separation of church and state? One, I feel like there should have never been a separation of church and state. The church should have been um, the government, but we didn't do that. So then we separated the church and state. And now here we are. They just passed law in California that you can go to church and you can even go to worship. But don't, don't offend the people around you by singing out loud. So now that's already in California. In Canada, right to our north, if you speak out about homosexuality whatsoever, that's a hate crime. So to our north, you can't talk about homosexuality, which the Bible talks about, because that's a hate crime. Um, to our west, they are now trying to control worship um, inside of churches. So that's to our west, that's to our north. Now all we gotta do is start trickling down. Uh, now, if you say uh, all lives matter, now you're a white supremacist. If you're a Republican, you're a white supremacist. If you're a Trump supporter, you're a white supremacist. So here, now here comes all these, here comes all these angles. Uh, what are we going to do? The Bible says, don't be deceived. What is the truth? What is the truth? What is the truth? What is the truth? Uh, point number three that I'd like to bring up is this whole, um, now there's this big movement for this cashless society and, um, how much easier it's gonna be. And now we've got a, because of the COVID-19 virus, there's a shortage on coins. So, and, and they give more reasons, more reasons, more reasons. And here's what I want you to, you to be aware of. Uh, we, not that we can control it, but I just don't want you to be deceived. They're gonna give us all these amazing reasons why we should be a cashless society. And there's a bunch of things that we could bring up on this. And the only one I really wanna bring up is, hey, open your eyes, open your eyes, Christians go uh, nail down revelations, get it in, because there's a couple of things that are coming in the end times. One of those things is one world government. One world government, okay? Um, that's gonna be one of two things or uh, a combination of two things, and the Bible does not say it's these two things. It's just what I'm seeing happening. So if I'm wrong, I will take credit for that wrong. I'm just gonna tell you this. Here's my opinion of what those one of two things is gonna happen. Either we're going to vote enough Muslims into the office to where, um, oh, let me say this, I'm sorry. So the Bible says two things are gonna happen. Um, there's gonna be one world government, three things. One world government, one world religion, and uh, one world currency, okay? So um, as far as one world government and religion happening, one of two things is gonna happen. Either we're gonna keep blindly um, voting Muslims into office to where we finally end up with a Muslim government, if that happens, uh, just like they do in the Eastern country, um, Islam will become our government. So um, you're going to have, there won't be a separation in church and state anymore. Um, Islam will be our government. When that happens, they will pass Sharia law. And under Sharia law, we, women will now become property. So all you women that continue to vote in uh, the Mus Muslims, I, I want to educate you to go and uh, read up on Sharia law so you can see what your fate is because you are now gonna be just like a cow. You're gonna be somebody's public property. And two men can get together and lie and say that they saw you with another man and they can do an honor killing and kill you in the street and all they need is two witnesses to say that they also um, knew that you were cheating. You are cattle. So um, all the ladies out there that are loving um, voting in the Muslims and they wanna allow that to happen just so you know what's coming for you. Um, you can vote them in, but after they're in, you don't get a vote, just so you know. So um, so here's what I think one of those two things, the one world government and the world one religion. It makes sense on one hand if we keep voting in uh, Muslims and Muslims take over the government and then Islam naturally becomes uh, the religion. 
um, Guillermo and I are debating is Jesus God and I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Oh man, why did you bring that up right now? Okay, uh, Vicki, don't let me forget that. Let me finish this thought and then um, I will get back to that. I'll, I'll, run, I'll run it down to you real quick. Um, and so to answer your question in a nutshell, you're both right, but if you don't know how to explain it, you don't get to pick one of those sides. <laughs> she says, Guillermo and I are debating is Jesus God, is Jesus God, and I believe, Guillermo and I are debating, is Jesus God, and I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, I got you. Um, I got you. You're both right, but if you don't explain it right, then you're both wrong. And I'll explain what that means here in a minute. Um, okay. Da, 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 da. So the Bible says we're going to have one world government one world religion, one world currency. So the one one way I can see that happening is vote enough Muslims in, they take over the government. Naturally, um, that becomes the religion, then Sharia law, and then we don't get a choice. If you're not gonna be a Muslim, they're just gonna kill you, and there'll be no punishment for that. And Protest if you want to, they'll just cut your head off when you do it. So all the freedoms you have to ride and protest now, that makes you feel good, makes you feel like you have power. Well, that's because of where we're at with uh, religion today. Uh, if Islam ends up taking over, go do your riding. They're gonna shoot you dead in the street. So there went that freedom. So go ahead and uh, do your thing. Um, the other way that can happen is if we continue to um, vote in uh, democ Democrats, um, what's going to happen is we're going to turn into a, a socialistic, a, a socialism society, and then we're all going to be um, legal slaves, pretty much, no matter what race you're going to be. We're all going to be in a form of slavery, and the government's going to have absolutely full control. Uh, those morons at that time will probably still vote in um, Islam, and that will become our... our uh, so we might have like a one-world socialist um, government for a while, but that could still easily bleed over into a, uh Islamic government. Uh, you know, there's been talks for the last two years, the Pope and uh, Islamic um, members of leadership coming together over the last two years, seeing if they can unify the two faiths. So Catholicism is one of the largest religions in the world. So is Islam. You bring those two bad boys together, that's going to cover about two thirds of the world's religion right there. So there's just different ways it could happen. But here's the point. Um, one world government, one world religion, but the Bible speaks about one world currency. To do that, you've got to get all of our current current currency off of the market. So now here we are about these talks. Uh, whenever Obama was in office, he was already trying to unify the Canadian dollar, the American dollar, and uh, the Mexican peso um, was already trying to unify that. It just didn't happen. Now here we are. They're talking about telling us that we're going to have to go to a cashless society. I'm just telling you, don't be deceived. The Bible says don't fret over it because these things happen, have to happen. But the Bible says one world government, one world uh, religion, and one world currency. For that to happen, they've got to find ways to get our current currency off of the market. What are they talking about? A cashless society. Just giving you a heads up. Don't be deceived. Here's one of the topics I want to hit on before I answer your question, Vicky and Guillermo. Um, Black Lives Matter. I did not know this. I'm fixing to spend probably, I don't even know, the next week or two just tearing this thing apart. So I'm just going to hit this one thing, and I'm addressing this to my friends. Um, I want you all to research this and hit me up because I want to know the ins and outs of this. I'm fixing to do my own studying, but the last time I talked about Black Lives Matter, matter i got a bajillion messages and some were good and some were crazy i had a couple of phone calls i've still got a couple more meetings to have i'm not running from any of that let's have them because we need to hash this stuff out all i ask is that you don't come to me in your feelings and your emotions come to me with some truth and logic and please 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 the word of god but here's what i learned today that i wish i would have known two weeks ago whenever i had all those first calls so black lives matters has a constitution and pure plain and simple inside their constitution. I learned this this morning in church and this is what has set my heart on fire. I'm just fixing to start speaking about this stuff that I've always not ran from, but I wasn't interested in, but I'm just fixing to start speaking on it after I'm studied up on it and trying to educate us that are wanting to learn. Um, uh, Newman, good to see you on here, buddy. Uh, y'all need to, um, y'all need to like and follow Newman. He's a buddy of mine. He's a Christian friend of mine in Pakistan. And you want to come to me with Black Lives Matter and, and racist stuff and slavery stuff and all that. Um, I can handle the conversation. But when I think about this dude right here, it's really hard to have that conversation with my friends over here. Because Newman right there is a uh, minister in Pakistan. And his ministry is ministering to Christian slaves. 
that are legit. We're talking about slavery over here that happened 200 years ago that we know nothing about. You and I have never been a slave. You and I have never been slave owners. Newman here is a uh, missionary, a ministry in Pakistan, and his ministry is to Christian slaves who are in slavery to Muslims. Uh, the Christians there are uh, in debt, so they're building bricks by hand, building bricks by hand to get out of a debt that they can never get out of. So they are legal Christian slaves to the Islamic community over there. That's his ministry right there, this guy Newman right here. If you want to follow him, send him a firm request. Matter of fact, here pretty soon I'm going to try to uh, do a fundraiser, try to get some money together because he's got about 150 to 200 people over there that do Bible study with him all the time, and they need Bibles, and those Bibles cost about nine bucks a piece. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing some posts, see if anybody wants to donate, see if we can take care of some of that stuff or whatever. Uh, I'm going to do some online Bible study with those groups of people that are over there um, just to start teaching them the Word of God. They're the people who have one one page of the Bible folded up and wadded up in their pocket, and they, they covet it and would give their life for that one piece of paper. And uh, he's got pictures of putting a full Bible in their hands. You know, they're just crying and they're amazed and all that. So we want to get full-blown Bibles in their hands so they're not running around with one little piece of Bible paper um, all their life. But anyway, this dude deals with Christian slaves today, Christian slaves that are enslaved to uh, Muslims in Pakistan. Amazing guy. I love uh, Newman. Thank you for being on here, buddy. A little shout out for you. Um, so Black Lives Matter. Here's what I learned this morning that's got me ready to jump in all this political junk and let's start addressing it with the Word of God and, and teaching us Christian brothers and sisters what's up. So uh, got some people driving around. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement and my friends that are all about the Black Lives Matter thing, get a hold of me and help me chop this up because... In the next two weeks, I'm going to be fully armored for this thing. I've got a lot of studying to do. But um, but here's, here's the thing, man. In their constitution, it says that one of their goals is to destroy the nucleus of the family. What? What? It's in the, the Black Lives Matter constitution. One of their goals is to, and they're not trying to hide it. It's black and white. I, I, you can Google it one of their constitutional goals is to destroy the nucleus of the family. What in the world does destroying the nucleus of the family have to do with pushing Black Lives Matter agenda? If Black Lives Matter agenda is supposed to be about helping the black people that are oppressed, helping the black people that are um, being darn done dirty or done bad by cops more so than other races. If it's supposed to be helping that community, how can one of your goals be to destroy the nucleus of the family? When I heard that this morning, I'm telling you, there was a fire in my heart because I have a lot of friends that are on that kick and it didn't bother me that they were on that kick because I knew what the Bible said about it. But now that I know that one of their agendas is to destroy the nucleus of the family, um, can't not talk about it anymore. Can't not address that. God instituted the family. And now you've got this movement that has taken the world by storm. And if you don't say that you agree with Black Lives Matter, you're a racist. And then I find out that also if you believe Black James Smith, my brother Jason Cole, please don't be that way. Don't be what way? What am I doing? Um, um, Anyway, the, in, in the, um, be what way? I don't know what you're saying, bro. Tell me what, what way I'm being. Um, but in the Constitution of the Black Lives Matter, it says that their aim is to, uh, you know, sensible Americans are not forming to destroy the nucleus of the family. I don't know that. All I know is that I read it in the Constitution today, bro. Um, and I'm not, I'm not arguing that or whatever. It's just something, it's something that I read. Here's what I also think, James. You and I, you and I are friends. Um, this isn't going to turn into a heated argument or anything like that. I've got lots of friends that are on part of the Black Lives Movement. The thing that I'm learning, though, is that my friends that are on that, they're on it from a good side. Go to blacklivesmatter.com, okay? Uh, I will read that, but I'll, and I'll also send you whatever what I read. But uh, my friends that know me, and I know them well, that are a part of that, they mean well, they have good points, all that stuff. 
But then whenever you, you read other stuff or you talk to other people, there's more motives behind it. There's people that are pushing, there's people that are pushing this motive that is not what, like what my friends are, like James here, I haven't uh, talked to him to hear everything that he said, but like I've got other friends that I love dearly that I'm close to. Um, they're also supportive of the Black Lives Matter. When they give me the reasons, like I totally get it. Like I get that, I get that. But it's just like anybody that picks up any, any other uh, thing that they want to follow or, or trend on or whatever. There's certain parts of it that they know, so they're very passionate about it, but they don't always know everything that comes with it. They don't know my friends that support Black Lives Matter. They have good intentions, but there's other people behind the scenes that are riding on the coattails of Black Lives Matter to get their agenda across, and it gets very political, and if you're not well-educated and you don't do the research to go dig this stuff out, Every time it comes up, people are gonna be misunderstanding each other. People are gonna start um, being offended with one of each other and oh, you're just one of them and oh, you're one of them. James, my friend on here that's commenting, he told me somewhere to go look. I'm gonna go look and I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna look that up and learn everything that I can. He knows me. Matter of fact, he knows me from um, my prison path. So he, he doesn't have a question on whether I'm racist or not. He knows me. He's seen me hugging other racists and loving on other racists. That's not our problem. He feels like I'm miseducated on some stuff, and I could be because I haven't read everything. I don't know if he knows everything yet either. The point is, is us Christians, we've got to start talking about this stuff and addressing it because we feel like we've got our mind made up. We feel like we know how we feel about certain things, but the people that I've talked to so far, they only know some surface level stuff. They don't know about the stuff going behind the scenes that are pushing their other agendas. They're just using the Black Lives Matter because it's popular right now. So they're riding on those coattails, but behind the scenes, they're pushing a whole nother thing, man. And it gets gets so shady. Um, the other thing about, uh, oh man, I need to address uh, Vicky. Don't, amen, brother, there will always be some bad apple. Yeah, absolutely, bro. Absolutely, I agree with that 100%. 100%, I'm not even with the radical cops. I, I know that about you, bro. I've never even questioned that. And you know me too, man, I, I love you to death. But I am, I'm gonna spend a lot of time researching this, a lot of time because um, we can't be saying that we stand, as Christians, we can't pick sides and say, we're gonna believe this and we're gonna run with this or whatever. If it does not 100% line up with the word of God, you just can't, doesn't matter what color you are, what race you are, whatever. You can't join a movement if it doesn't line up with the word of God. You absolutely can't, I don't care what it is. You know, Black Lives Matter, we're talking about it right now because it's hot and heavy. Give it a month, we'll be talking about something else. There'll be another something that happens because that's how Satan works. Distractions, distractions, distractions. That'll play down, some, another event will happen. Everybody will forget about Black Lives Matter. They'll forget about the coronavirus and boom, we'll be focused on this all of a sudden. And then whenever we spend six months hating each other over this, Boom, another something's gonna happen and nobody's gonna talk about coronavirus, Black Lives Matter, or that something that happened there. It's gonna be another something. The problem is, is when all the somethings come up, what does the word of God say about that something? What does the word of God say about that something? Because Satan is having a field day right now separating everybody, separating everybody. Everybody's starting to hate each other. Now all of a sudden the whole world's racist. The, the world was not racist a, a few months ago. Not the whole world, we had a, you know, a few sections of people that are what, what, we've come a long way in the things of racism. Even prison, one of the most racial places you'll ever find yourself. I did 11 years there. My last few years there, we came a long way from racism there. When I first went down, my white homeboys were getting on to me for eating with Hispanics or blacks or whatever. When I left, everybody in the day room was eating together. We, we've come a long way. The world was not as, the world was not as racist last six months ago as it is today. How did that happen? In six months, how did the world go from not being as racist to six months, here we are now, it's ex the world is becoming very, very racist. People who weren't racist two months ago are racist now because things that are being said or whatever. Now I'm getting on a tangent, but you know what I'm saying? I'm speaking to us Christians, us Christians. Yeah, there needs to be a Christian mo movement of truth. We've got to get into truth. What does the Bible say about whatever it is we're wanting to talk about? The last thing I want to talk about, uh, I'm not going to forget the two questions that I've been asked. I'm going to hit those last. The last thing I want to talk about is Matthew chapter uh, 24 still. Here's what I don't want to happen, and I'll wrap this up quick. And I think it's verse 13 or 14. Uh, verse 12, here we go. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. Man, this has went way longer than I was anticipating. 
Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Read verse 12 again. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And here's what I've learned over watching the world the last couple of months. They had a saying in prison. Um, matter of fact, I think it was in the county jail before I ever actually went to prison. And they said, uh, it was almost like a joke. <clears throat> they would say, hey, if you're not racist when you go in there, you'll be racist when you come out. Okay? I, was, I don't know about that. So I get to prison, and I and, and I have some experiences. Somebody told me the other day, they're like, you're a white dude, um, white privilege. You don't have any reason to talk about racism. And I was like, okay, well, let me tell you four experiences that I had that happened to me just because I was white in prison. And I told them the four examples, which don't matter. And when I was done, they're like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. And I said, that's the point right there. All of us that are debating whatever side of the fence of any topic that we want to talk about, the only idea we have is our ideas. That's the problem. That's the problem. The only idea you have is the ideas that you have. You don't know what's everybody in there, everybody else's head. You don't know what's in their history. Somebody tells me I have, I don't have the right to speak on racism. I tell them four events that happened to me in prison, and they're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. That's exactly the point across the world right now is the only ideas that anybody has is their own ideas. You don't know the story of so-and-so and what they've been through and what's going on with them. So your conclusions are very limited. That's why us as Christians have to take all of the stuff we want to believe and bounce it off the Word of God and line it up with Scripture because outside of Scripture what the Word of God says about whatever thing we're wanting to believe or get behind outside of the Word of God the only thing you're going on is your ideas and what little bit you know of whatever it is that you're wanting to follow I went through those experiences and I went to prison for 11 years and I and I was not racist and I came out not racist what I'm watching sitting back watching the world right now Watching what the media is spewing right now? The world is trying to make, if you're not racist, the world is trying to make you racist. If you don't hate cops, the media and the world is trying to make you hate cops. On and on and on. The problem is, is as lawlessness abounds, the, the Bible promises that the love of many is going to grow cold. And we're going to see that. Um, I've got people that are talking about racism that I've known that have never been racist before. I don't even know where that's coming from. And now here it is over here. All this, all this other stuff, all these other topics. The love of many is going to grow cold because lawlessness is going to abound. For you to get to the point to where your love can grow cold, it's going to be because you're going to be one of those that's going to get wrapped up in the hype of the news. You're going to get wrapped up in the media. You're going to get wrapped up in all these events that are going on around you in this world. And you're not going to bring the word of God to them. When you don't do that, you have no choice, no choice but to get wrapped up in your emotions and your feelings and start making decisions on what you want to do, what you want to follow, which side of the fence you're going to be on. That's how your love is going to go cold because you're you're not taking the word of God to the world and all the things that are going on in it. You're taking your feelings and your emotions and you're trying to make these logical decisions based on feelings and emotions. It's just not going to happen. Um, Black Lives Matter movement, whatever side of the fence of that you're going to be on, that is going to be the source of a lot of uh, the love of many growing cold. It's going to be the source of a lot of churches being split, families being split, uh, split friendships ending because of what side of the fence that you're going to bring on. And if you're not going to bring the word of God to it, all you're going to be told is if you say all, all lives matter, then you're a racist. If you don't believe that um, black lives matter by itself or whatever, um, then you're cold hearted and you're missing the point, whatever. That's just stuff that's being said. Those are truths that are being said. If you don't, if you think all lives matter, you're racist. Somebody said that. Now it's all over the place, all over the media. And you better not say that you think all lives matter. But the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says Jesus came once to die for all. According to Jesus, according to the Bible, all lives matter. According to the world right now, if you dare say all lives matter, you're a racist. 
to friends who don't take the word of God and line it up with whatever's going on in the world. The love is going to grow cold. And like I said, churches, family, friendships, things are going to start splitting and ended. Why did they end? Because you picked us out of the fence and you didn't line it up with the word of God. So you came to it with uh, your feelings and your emotions. Plain and simple. The point of today was the Bible says 40 to 50 times, be not deceived. Do not be deceived. 40 to 50 times. Why would God need to say that so many times? Because he knows we are lazy believers by nature. And we just listen to what the preacher says and then we listen to what the news says. And then we find our place to fall. Don't be deceived. So uh, I got asked two questions and I'm going to try to answer those in just a couple of minutes. The first one was from uh, Janice. And she had asked me right before we logged on to Facebook Live, she said, if um, if Satan was an angel and then he fell, did that change his status to where he could not no longer know what God's plans are? And so a couple of things. Uh, so he was an angel. Then he fell. The Bible now calls him a fallen angel. Um, but the point that I want to make is, is that it doesn't matter what his status is. Matter of fact, when he was an angel, um, that didn't matter either because uh, the angels don't know the mind of God. They don't even know the, the heart of God necessarily. Angels are messengers. So they're basically messengers that are waiting for God to tell them, go do this. So whether they're good angels or they were fallen angels, none of them knew what God's plan and purpose was. They were messengers waiting for God to say, boom, go do whatever. So Satan has never known God's plan. Satan has never known God's mind even when he was a good angel. He surely doesn't know it now. But here's what I want to say, because I always want you to think um, outside of the box. Um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, Vicki and Guillermo, I'll get to your question next. Hebrews chapter 1, 14 says this. Are they not all ministering spirits or angels sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Let me read it again. Are they not all ministering spirits or angels sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. God knew everything from the beginning of the world. All your days were recorded in his book before you lived one. What does that tell me with this verse right here? Satan does not need to know God's plan. All he needs to know is that when people are born, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 tells me that there are ministering spirits or angels that are uh, sent charge over us that God already knows that we're going to accept him one day. Their job is to protect us until... Why are you echoing now? I don't know. Um, am I echoing to everybody or is that just Tammy? We ran into that last week, but I was only echoing to one person. So I'm going to keep talking because I'm almost done anyway. So hopefully the echo is not too bad. It might be because I'm screaming. So the Bible says God knew everything you would ever do. All your days were recorded in his book before you lived one. Hebrews 1.14 says, Aren't these all ministering spirits or angels sent forth to protect them until the day of their salvation? Satan has never known the mind of God. Satan doesn't need to know the mind of God because the Bible teaches us that when somebody is born today, that God knew from the foundation of the world that one day they would receive him. He sent angels, messengers, angels to protect them until the day that they inherit salvation so that they don't need satan doesn't need to know the mind of god all he needs to know is boom felice felice is born why is that girl right there surrounded by angels he gets all of his demon soldiers together boom go study that girl go attack that girl report back to me whatever works that's how it goes in the spiritual world. Satan doesn't need to know the mind of God or the heart of God. He, he never did know God's plans. Never did know. He was waiting on God's orders. When God gave orders, he went and did what he did. When another angel uh, was told what to do by God, he went and did it. Outside of that, they don't know the mind of God. Nobody knew the, knew, uh, the mind of God. What they do know is in the spiritual world, Hebrews 1.14 tells us that we are protected by angels because God already knows those who are going to inherit him and who aren't because all of your days are recorded before you live one of them. So those people that are born that God already knows they're going to receive him one day until that day that they receive him, he sends angels charged over, charge you over you to uh, protect you till the day that you receive him. 
that's all Satan needs to know. As soon as you're born, boom, that kid right there is surrounded by angels. Hey, look out demons. Go try everything you can. Report back to me what works, and we're going to devise this plan to try to destroy them. That's how that works. Question number two was from uh, Vicky and Guillermo. So it sounds like and I may get this wrong. I'm going to answer this what I what I believe I read. Um, it sounds like Guillermo believes that um, Jesus is God, and Vicky believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Very great question. So what we're really talking about here is the Trinity, which a lot of people run from, don't want to talk about. This stuff gets too deep. Um, actually, it's not very deep at all. Not really. Uh, people just run from it because. They don't study it. They don't ask the Holy Spirit questions and good stuff like that. So here's the thing. <clears throat> to answer this question, you need to know a couple of things. Somewhere along the way, we have God, we have Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit. We know those three things are real. What we can't figure out is, or what we have trouble figuring out, is are all three of those one or all three of those things separate and they act as one and uh, now I can't you're really confusing me now so we don't really talk about the Trinity because it gets very confusing to people in my study in my questioning I came down to one question uh, that really helped me wrap my mind around this my wife has heard me talk about this nine bajillion times but it's important to talk about it because it comes up a lot it just came up today so here's the deal you got to ask yourself, one, where do we first get the name Jesus? Because the Bible says in several places that Jesus um, is the first of creation, and that's very misleading. He was not the first created thing. Whenever you break it down into the original Greek, it, it's actually he is, the, he is the beginning of creation. Colossians says um, all things were created by him, through him, and for him. And through him all things consist. You need to remember verses like that. And through him all things consist. All things were created through him, by him, for him, and through him all things consist. That gets a little wordy. Let's say it again. Because through Jesus, all things were created by him, by Jesus, through Jesus, for Jesus, and all things consist through and in Jesus. You got to remember this verse. The problem is... The Bible says that Jesus was in the beginning with God. He was the beginning, the architect of creation. The problem scripturally is, is we don't even see the name Jesus until we get to Matthew when the angel says, Mary, you're gonna have a son and you're gonna call him Jesus. Before there, you'd never see the word Jesus, okay? So here's the problem. If Jesus existed somehow in the beginning with God, how come we don't see the name Jesus until Matthew. So here's the question that helps with everything. Who is Jesus before he gets the name Jesus? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we can stop right there and look up about four or five places in the New Testament and tell Guillermo that um, he is right. Ride with me now, because like I told you earlier, you're both right, but if neither one of you know how to explain it, then you're both wrong, okay? So your husband Guillermo says that um, Jesus is God. Vicki, you said that Jesus is the Son of God. I'm telling you that both of those things are right, but if you can't explain it, then it doesn't matter because both of you are wrong, okay? So John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? So right there, Guillermo, you get a sticky star award. Jesus is God. It just said that. How do I know that the Word is God? How do I know that the Word that you're talking about, that was in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God? How do I know that that was Jesus? Because in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? So John 1, 1 tells us who is Jesus before he gets the name Jesus in Matthew. John 1, 1 answers that. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. <clears throat> Another key. 
in the Greek when it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You need to know that that word, Word, means every thought, idea, and spoken word of God. Every thought, idea, and spoken word of God. Why do you need to know that? Because the Bible says in Colossians that through Jesus Christ, all things were made by him, through him, for him, and through him all things consist. All things were made that were made. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was the Word of God. Every thought, idea, and spoken Word of God became flesh. Every thought, idea, and spoken Word of God got flesh wrapped around it and dwelt among us, and we gave it the name Jesus. Okay? Boom. Genesis chapter 1, verse word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was void. Talks about the water and the spirit uh, uh, hovered above it. You got the Holy Spirit. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. When you understand John 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And you understand that the Word means every thought, idea, and spoken Word of God. When you get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, and it says... Then God said, everything after the word said is Jesus without having the name Jesus. Because Jesus is the spoken word, thought, and idea of God made flesh. What? And it's the only way that it can be because one, it's scripturally true. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. How is the word how is the word with God, but he also is God? Because you've got to understand, before Jesus gets the name Jesus, he is the spoken word, thought, and idea of God. That's who Jesus is. He's the spoken word, thought, and ideas of God. That's who Jesus is before he gets the name Jesus. He's the spoken word of God. God is in the beginning. Boom. And God said, let there be. All that let there be is Jesus coming out of God's mouth without having the name Jesus. It's the word of God coming out of his mouth. Why is he the first of creation but not the first created thing? He's not the first created thing because Jesus is a spoken word, thought, and ideas of God made flesh. He's not the first created thing. That's why you got to break it down in the group. He's the beginning of creation because as soon as God started speaking, Speaking, things began to be created. When Colossians says, by him all things were made. How? Because Jesus is the spoken word of God. How did God create? Through his spoken word. Through him all things were made that were made. How? Because Jesus is the spoken word of God. God created by speaking. Do you understand what I'm saying? In the beginning was the spoken word of God. And the spoken word of God was with God. And the spoken word of God was with God. When you understand who Jesus is before he gets the name Jesus, he's the spoken word of God made flesh. We give him the name Jesus and he dwells among us. Before he gets the name Jesus, he's the spoken word of God. He's the thoughts of God. He's every idea God has ever had. So yes, he's in the beginning with God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, when God starts saying, let there be, everything coming out of God's mouth is Jesus before he gets the name Jesus. Because Jesus is the spoken word of God. So is Jesus God? Yes. But if you can't explain it, then you're wrong. Then how is Jesus the son of God? Because he speaks to Mary and says, you're going to have a child and you're going to call him Jesus. The spoken word of God becomes flesh in a womb and is born to us to dwell among us and that makes him the son of Jesus Christ because God spoke to that womb and when that spoken word of God took on flesh we gave it a name Jesus so it makes him the son of God he spoke to a womb and the spoken word of God the spoken thoughts the spoken ideas of God become flesh and we give it the name Jesus so he's the son of God but how is he also God? Because in the beginning was the spoken word of God, and the spoken word of God was with God, and the spoken word of God was 
God because Jesus, before he gets the name Jesus, is every spoken thought, idea, and word of God. Booyah. Is Jesus God? Yes, but if you can't explain it, don't confuse people. Is Jesus the Son of God? Yes, but if you can't explain it, don't confuse people. So Vicky and Guillermo, you're both right. Yes, Guillermo, he is God. Yes, Vicky, you're right, he is the Son of God, but you gotta be able to explain it or we just confuse the mess out of everybody. So anyway, we went two hours. Oops, didn't mean to keep you that long again, but uh, hopefully you learned something. Uh, appreciate everybody's feedback. My boy James, thanks for jumping on. You know my heart, you know my motives, bro. Um, I'm gonna do a whole bunch of research. I know you will too. Everybody will. I know I'm gonna get some flack from this video. I'm cool with it because I'm a sponge. I want to learn. Don't make me dance in here. <laughs> he confused me. Who did? Did I confuse you or did uh, did uh, Guillermo confuse you? <laughs> Please let me know I didn't confuse you, Biggie. Who confused you? Hopefully it was Guillermo. I hope I didn't confuse you. Connecting the dots. Okay, good, Natalia. Uh, Royal. Booyah. <laughs> Oh man, uh, Vicky, let me know. Did you did it did it click? Do you get it or no? All you said was he confused me. I, let me know if you got it. I don't want to leave anybody confused. I enjoyed it. God bless you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, sweetie. Let me know if you got it. Now pray us out. We got you back, man. I love you, Royal. Royal, man, you need to uh, spend about a week or so. Oh, Guillermo. Okay, good. So do you got it now, Vicky? Are you good on the whole? Is Jesus God? Is Jesus the Son of God? Are you good? Uh, okay. Um, Royal, me and you need to spend about a week or two really studying, really doing some research. Maybe you uh, on this Black Lives uh, Matter stuff. Um, uh, Mark, don't say preach it, white boy. Now you're going to make me uh, racist, dude. Just kidding. Um, Royal, maybe me and you can spend a week, a good week, maybe a week and a half studying ins and outs of this uh, Black Lives Matter stuff or whatever because uh, you're obviously a black man. I love you to death. You're a good preacher, a good orator, good teacher, all that good stuff. Let's figure out what the actual agenda really is. Find out what the Word of God says about all that stuff, Royal, and let's me and you do a, um, a dual Facebook Live uh, truck church together, right? And um, and I'm not going to ask just anybody to do that. I'm, I'm asking you because you're a believer. I know where your heart's at, and you're a very well-educated man. So if that's something you want to do, let me know, bro, and let's... Uh, Let's start tackling this thing together because this topic ain't going away. So we need to know what they're teaching, what they're pushing. We need to know what the Word of God says and how us Christians respond to that. So Royal, let me know if that's something you're interested in. And uh, we'll do that. We'll tag team that together. I found what you're talking about, Brother Jason. Please post how we can support you financially. Um, if somebody wants to support financially, really all I've got is uh, um, Venmo, PayPal, or people can... Uh, I can give an address for somebody to send something to. I don't really have anything set up online to do that, but I do do Venmo and PayPal if somebody wants to bless me with something. You know I speak at 100. Royal, I know. I wouldn't ask anybody else, bro. Okay, so let's do that. So you're in. So here's me saying it, and here's the invite. Two weeks. Let's do two weeks. Take two weeks, and we can chop it up in between then. Uh, but take two weeks. Learn what the uh, – let's really, really learn and dive in surface level stuff and then behind the scenes what is that black lives matter what is it really really about what's it really about surface level and then deeper what does the word of god say how does it line up with that because this isn't going away people don't want to talk about it because they're afraid if they speak up on it they're racist all of a sudden so let's really come at it with a christian perspective man let's just let's bang it out bro let's bang it out we'll do it on facebook live and we'll, we'll talk about what we've learned we'll take questions from the people that are watching and man just see what god does with it okay uh, thank you, Royal. Love you, homeboy. All right, I'm going to pray this out because I've kept you all too long. Thank you for riding with me, man. Everybody, we've had 40-something people the whole time and then other people in and out, but um, two hours is a long time. I'm almost sorry, but we covered a lot of good stuff. Uh, pray for me this week because I'm going to get all kinds of flack for this video. Um, I'll be fine. It ain't going to hurt my feelings none, but just pray that I handle it well, handle it with love, and that I handle it with uh, truth. Uh, Lord God, I just thank you for this day that you've given us and blessed us with. Thank you for people that are hungry for your word that will stay here for two hours uh, listening to your word, God. Um, expose anything to me. If I said anything wrong, if I taught anything wrong, expose that to me. Um, 
through people, through your Holy Spirit, however you want to do it, Lord God. I always want to speak your truth. I don't want to preach out of my feelings and my emotions if it doesn't line up with your truth, Father God. So um, I make myself receptive and, and, and vulnerable and transparent in those areas. If I'm wrong on anything that I said, um, just bring those things to my attention and help me to receive that in, in love and correction. And um, But I just thank you for your truth. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you that I have friends of all races um, that I can speak to and they can speak to me and we don't have to worry about offense or hard feelings even if we our beliefs are slightly different on certain things or God I, I'm thankful for that um, that I've got amazing friends of all races of all denominations of all faiths and uh, just learn a lot from every one of your creations Father God so thank you for everybody watching Truck Church everybody's going to watch it on the replay uh, thank you for this week and uh, just help all of us Christians that are trying to do right trying to live by your word trying to learn everything we can and line it up with your truth father god so everybody that's watching now and later on the replay they're going to have their own confrontations with people throughout the next weeks and months lord god and i pray that all of us could respond with truth and with love father god and, and not a debating you know argumentative spirit father god so pray for a, a week for everybody of just god moments lord just use this up this week just use this up use this up Use us up, Lord God, and, and uh, we'll give you the thanks and the praise for it. Thank you for saving so many people the last few weeks. Thank you for letting so many baptisms take place the last few weeks. Thank you that you're on the move, no matter what kind of chaos we're watching in the world. You're on the move, and you tell us not to fret. You got this, and I just really believe that you got this. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Agree with every word you said tonight. Well, thank you, Sharon. That is high, high. Um, praise and honor coming from you i love you to get to death sharing and i value your opinion big time god bless you brother sally god bless you i went to a black school yeah you did i forgot about that mom i forgot about that actually uh what'd you say though i went to a black school in the ninth grade and some of the black people hated me because i was white the ones i grew up with that knew me thought i was okay it didn't make me ah, i keep scrolling it make me hate black people. I learned there's two kinds of black people, just like white people. There's going to be those that hate no matter what color you are for whatever reason. I just don't let the hate that people have for me to cause my love to grow cold. That's a good testimony right there, Mom. Love you. All right, love y'all. I'm going to get off here because I've kept y'all from ever, and then I'll go read some comments. Love y'all. Have a blessed week. Uh, just means a lot to me that you even show up to listen to what I have to say, man. <laughs> God bless y'all. Love y'all.